Hey, Jeremy, can you admit people now? Yeah, I can. Thank you. Okay, cool. I'm, keep, I'm getting rid of that for that. me for me to do and giving that yeah. to me, please. <laughs> I'll keep an eye on that as uh, as we go through. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Welcome, everyone. We're so glad that you all could join us for um, our October luncheon. I almost said November. No, I don't know what month it is. I don't even know what year it is. Um, but thank you all for being here. My name is Melissa Skinner. I am the 2022-2021 AMA Las Vegas president. And let's get started. So today we're going to speak about marketing for the casino floor and winning back the player. We have a panel of three guest speakers for you. One is Megan Slyke. <laughs> I don't want to mess it up, Megan. I'm so sorry. She's the director of marketing at Aristocrat America. We also have Brian Christopher. He's a social influencer for casinos at bcslots.com. And Julia Carcamo, the President and Chief Brand Strategist for J. Carcamo and Associates. We do always love to give shout outs to our annual sponsors. So we're, of, of course, so excited that um, we can be back to Fleming soon. We do have some things cooking and we'll have a really big announcement for our November luncheon. So please make sure that you guys do sign up for our newsletter or follow us on social, um, which I will share our platforms and those handles shortly. And of course, we love to give extra love to our annual cash sponsor, the UNLV Lee Business School. We are so grateful for them and all that they do for our chapter. Now, I did want to let you guys know we did award a scholarship just recently to Kaylee Nee at UNLV. We can't wait to get back to doing raffles at Fleming's to help support more students next year. Obviously, we are not doing them today, but I did want to let you know that we did award a scholarship. Now, please let take yourself to um, If anyone is hired, please let us know. You have 30 seconds to give your spiel and just let us know where we can apply. Anyone? All right, we know times are hard. Now, upcoming events, we are hoping to have another volunteer event this December with Three Square to help hungry kids and families during the holiday season. As we all know, this year is uh, going to be diff a difficult one um, during the holidays for those greatly affected by COVID. And now, please follow us and sign up for our newsletter at amalasvegas.com to get updates on our events and our November luncheon. I'll leave this screen up for a minute. So, oh, well, I thought. <laughs> I'll leave this screen up for a minute so that you guys can do that. All right. So now I would like to give a huge shout out and thank you, or we would like to give as AMA, um, to Bethany Kozal. She is the marketing manager at Gaming Arts and our very own VP of communications here at the Las Vegas, the AMA Las Vegas chapter. Um, thank you so much, Bethany, for securing these wonderful speakers from your industry. Now, Megan, I would like you to introduce yourself and go ahead and take it away. Perfect. Thank you so much, Marissa, and good morning. Well, I guess good afternoon. That shows how my day is going, everybody. Um, thank you so much for having me. It's an absolute privilege to be here, and I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, just as a brief introduction for myself, my name is Megan Slyke. I am the Director of Marketing for Aristocrat, specifically for the Americas region. So essentially everything from the top of Canada down to the tip, the tip of Chile um, falls to me in the marketing world. Um, so super excited to be here today. I've been in Las Vegas for about seven years, specifically in the hospitality industry. My background is a combination of both the property side. I previously worked for MGM Resorts and Win Las Vegas. Did a brief stint in e-commerce with 1-800-Flowers.com, supporting the Harry and David brands. 
Um, and then my previous role before coming to Aristocrat was actually with r, &R Partners, where I specifically supported the Las Vegas Convention and Visitors Authority. So been around the block a little bit when it comes to the Las Vegas scene. Um, and I'm super excited to chat with you guys about the casino floor and what it looks like given our current climate. So um, kind of moving into just a brief introduction of Aristocrat for those of you who might not be as familiar. Um, we are a world leading gaming company. We specifically specialize both in land based slot machines and digital operations when it comes to gaming. Um, I, I put our mission statement up here because I think it's a really important thing, especially in the climate that we're currently living in of bringing joy to life through the power of play. And from a cultural perspective at Aristocrat, we really adhere to that um, in a pretty pretty amazing way with our employees and you know especially in a time where things have been especially challenging for the casino industry this has been something that we've really gravitated towards and really held on to as we've done our best to support wherever we can as a leading supplier in the space um, for those of you who may be familiar with slot machines but maybe not necessarily familiar with suppliers if you've ever played a buffalo game if you've played an aristocrat game if you've ever played something like lightning link or dragon link or maybe something that's a little bit more um licensed product like Big Bang Theory. Those are all games that our, uh, our company is uh, the game designers for. So um, I also put our values up here too, specifically because all about the player I think is really fitting for this conversation. And when it came time for us to really think about what it was gonna look like in a world where casinos were shut down and then we had to think about how we were going to not only support our customers, but win the player back. That was something that we really leaned into. Um, we are a global operation. We're licensed in over 300 different jurisdictions, which is I'm sure you can imagine very daunting. Um, and we have a variety of employees around the world that support um, our land-based and our digital operations throughout our organization. So um, tons of opportunity um, and it's just been a really exciting time to work for Aristocrat. So um, for starters, I wanted to move into, you know, some data as it relates to our recovery from a supplier standpoint. So obviously, you know, we went through a completely unprecedented event, right? As a, as a supplier who, from a relationship standpoint, our customer is casino operators, but our end user is the player. This was a really unique situation as it was for everyone to suddenly have no machines on in any casinos. So, um, you know, we took a we continue to take a pulse check on what the data looks like and what the response is that we're seeing. This is actually from the AGA membership, the American Gaming Association's most recent town hall in regards to expected future casino visitation. So as you can see, you know, there's been a significant dip. Um, but as we kind of move through this recovery standpoint, we're seeing this start to rise over the course of time. You know, 46% of Americans say that the casino industry is handling its reopening well. And I would agree with that when it comes to health and safety of its patrons and employees, um, which is up from 33% in July, which was around the time that a lot of our casino partners started to reopen. Um, and 85% who plan to visit a casino in the next three months say that the industry is doing a good job. And I just think that these are things that are important to consider because it's easy to sit there and say, you know, we're in recovery mode and things are going great. You know, times are tough and we can totally understand that. And the reality is, is that everyone's comfort level when it comes to entering a casino at this point in time is very different. And we have to consider all of those viewpoints when it comes to making decisions and doing what we can to be the best assistance for our customers as we move through this with them. Um, so moving from that, you know, I think one of the most unexpected, or I shouldn't say unexpected, but one of the most interesting pieces of this for me personally, as a marketing person was all of the dollars that had to go into the cleanliness procedures from a casino standpoint. It's one thing to reopen a casino and it, you know, it sounds silly, but for, you know, I went to school on the East coast and a variety of my friends, you know, both from a marketing standpoint and a communication communication standpoint, may have honestly only been in a casino once or twice in their life. They don't understand that these doors don't necessarily lock. This isn't a normal situation. Um, and so, you know, we saw this, the majority of reopenings starting in late Q2. Um, and most of the patterns that we were seeing, I don't, I don't want to say we're similar and that everyone's was the same because to be honest with you, we've had hundreds of conversations with our customers and every single situation is different and we've done our best to adapt to that. But obviously social distancing, every other machine for the most part is off right now. 
um, you know, we were able to lean into something like our edge X cabinet where the pod dimensions just happened to be six feet apart so that all four machines in one bank can be on. That was something that we could present as a unique solution to our customers. Obviously, you know, we went from masks being optional specifically in Las Vegas to there being a mandate in the casino space. That was something to consider. Hand sanitizer, temperature checks, rearranged floors. This was probably one of the only times that casinos have had a chance to completely actually reconfigure their floor, not even necessarily when it came to adhering to social distancing, right? Like this is the first time, arguably since they've opened, that they've had their entire floor shut down and didn't necessarily have to just have walls up or pipe and drape to rearrange pieces and parts as it's as it was still functioning. So we really utilized that to help our customers as best as we could to adhere to the social distancing guidelines, but at the same time, you know, really figure out if there were other things that we could do to support them. Maybe there were things that they've been wanting to do for a long time, but it was just super challenging. And now they basically had an entire floor shut down and they had more time to implement those things. So not necessarily, you know, saying that it's a positive thing that that casinos were closed because obviously that's not a win for the industry, but we did try and find the positivity where we could from a support standpoint in order to do that. Um so moving into the next piece, I mean obviously like I said, you know, an unprecedented wave was felt in the industry, you know, and we really when we sat down as a team, as aristocrat, and thought about how we were going to move through this, we had three main buckets that we were focused on. The first was our people, the second was our customers, and the third was our business. And I say that in that specific order because we really did put our business last. This was not an opportunity for us to take advantage of, you know, the fact that floors were shut down and go sell we took an assist approach and that's what we came to our customers with was the aristocrat assist and really took some time to think about what we could help them do to ensure that they had the most support from us that they could need and also ensure their business continuity and ours when it comes to moving through recovery so you know, obviously there's been an impact on casinos, workers, the local community, the national economy. I don't think any single person on this call would disagree with me in the sense that 2020 has just been quite the year in all respects, whether it's you're experiencing Zoom burnout or you're trying to figure out how to market a slot machine when casinos aren't open and no one can go play them. It's been a very odd experience, but I do think with significant, you know, tragedy and impact, there also comes significant learnings. And I think that this was really an opportunity for our organization to have a little bit of a reset to figure out who we want to be in this industry and come out of this in a way to be the most strategic partner that we can so that when times do come back, which they will, that will be felt and remembered from our customers and from our players. Um, so moving into this kind of final piece, um, you know, what actions can industry suppliers take to support the industry? These are all approaches that we've taken, right? Staying connected. This was a time where we really leaned into social media. We embraced, you know, we had people submitting videos to us of them creating toilet paper rolls as casino slot reels and we're playing them because they miss their VGT red spin so much. Like, we appreciated our players, you know, just loyalty to us and still continuing to be a fan and really embracing the fact that, you know, even if they couldn't be in a casino right now, they were really looking forward to coming back and their support is something that we're forever indebted to them to, um, you know, because it's just something that is really amazing to see. Um, you know, content support, everything from, you know, providing marketing materials for our, our customers. I mean, Let's be real that our, our market has been significantly impacted by this. There's been a ton of teams that have unfortunately, you know, had to make cuts and we really stepped up to take on that for our customers so that they could still market to their players in a time where maybe they didn't necessarily have the resources to do that. Um, virtual customer support. I mean, when I tell you we've met with hundreds of customers, I truly mean hundreds of customers just on the phone. What do you need? How can we help? Um, you know, and the same thing comes with service. This was a time where we deployed, we have tech service representatives throughout the US. Um, 
and really allowed our customers to just use them as an extension of their team. You know, you need help reconfiguring your floor, we'll send out some text to help you. Um, getting the lights back on and getting all the games back on. I mean, our tech services team was absolutely amazing in doing that. Um, and, you know, we've seen a lot of different comfort level when it comes to what it looks like to win back the player. And I think that that's the important thing, right? You know, listening was the number one thing that we did. And I think we've done some interesting things to do that. One of which was actually with Brian, who's another speaker on this call where we actually did a survey um, of a ton of players to get feedback on what they wanted to see when casinos reopened. And it's asking those questions and understanding how those apply to maybe the things that we just got comfortable with in the casino industry. Not that they were necessarily wrong, just that we had always done it that way for a really long time. And everything from hearing about how, you know, um, players were really concerned about smoking in casinos. They were really concerned about you know, do I want to touch the button deck? Do you have a solution for that? You know, we provided everything from styluses to customers to traditional slot gloves, which believe it or not, used to be a thing many moons ago that people would don their slot gloves to go for their gaming experience. And we brought those back and players love them. Um, you know, and again, this isn't, I don't want this to be misconstrued as those were marketing opportunities. That was us just doing the right thing. And that's what aristocrat is as an organization. And I think, you know, taking that listening approach really paid off long term. What we're seeing now from a support standpoint is that every casino is different in regards to their comfort level, even when it comes to something as simple as a free play, free play promotion. You know, some people are, they want to just go all in and welcome their players back. And that's great. We can support them in that. If they want to be a little bit more buttoned up and have people schedule time to come in, sure, we can do that too. It's really just about having honest conversations and making sure that we do the best we can to provide our customers with the resources that end up with the end user of the player having a safe and healthy experience in a casino and still feeling comfortable coming back and playing. Because I think that's, if I can leave you with anything, it's that. I think that 2020 has been a really challenging year and we could all use a little bit of joy in our life. And if that means you go play a Buffalo machine for five minutes and you scream Buffalo super loud, if you win, I, I wholeheartedly ask you to send me a video if that happens to you. And I think it's those little moments that really have helped us change the game in what it looks like for the casino industry right now. So really appreciate your time. I believe we're doing Q&A at the end. So if you have any questions, feel free to throw those in the chat and I'll be more than happy to answer them later on. Yes, thank you so much, Megan. I do appreciate you throwing that in there. <laughs> I'm so bad, I forgot to mention that earlier with the questions. I'm just, I'm like one track mind for a minute there. Um, so thank you so much. And now guys, I would like to introduce you to Julia Carcamo and she's gonna give us a little bit and tell us a little bit about herself. Thank you, Marissa. And thank you, Bethany, for asking me to be a part of this. It's so nice to go back to Las Vegas and do some casino marketing, even if it's virtually right now. Um, so I wanted to just uh, tell you a little bit about myself. I, um, I'm in New Orleans. I started in Louisiana uh, gaming when it was just opening up to the regional markets. I started as, actually as a group sales rep for a casino that closed 10 weeks after I started. So my first experience wasn't exactly the best, but somehow I knew it was sort of my destiny. Um, eventually I opened up a little property in the heart of New Orleans. Um, and that really was kind of the moment that my affinity for branding was ignited. Um, after New Orleans, I went to Las Vegas and I worked a little bit for um, the corporate office, working on the core brands for Harrah's, which at the time were Harrah's, Showboat, Rio, and Total Rewards, which kind of shows how much uh, time has changed. And uh, as you can see, one day I got a call from a property that was under construction that you probably know. Um, so I think Megan and I may have crossed paths at some point, maybe a little distance, but at some point, right? Um, we're socially distanced, yes. Yeah. Um, it was really kind of the experience of a lifetime for me. I mean, I worked in the as, as we were building everything. So not only did I get a chance to work on developing the Win brand and the portfolio, but we also worked on the brands for 30 shops and restaurants all at the same time in Las Vegas and in Macau. Um, and after a few conversations and after some time, I headed to the Midwest 
Um, Isla Capri asked me to come and work with them in creating a, a brand that they wanted to be a little bit more contemporary. Um, but the reality was, and if you just click once, Megan, the reality was that this is what I was working with. <laughs> um, you know, most of the properties were aging and in need of more in need of capital improvements than they were in need of branding. Um, that being said, the more we looked at it and the more we worked with it, the more we spoke to customers and really looked at our opportunities, I had a chance to really kind of introduce this iconic brand, which a lot of people didn't even realize that Isla Capri owned at the time that we were going through this whole rebranding process. So, you know, people often ask me if the win experience was my favorite. And although it was, it was very, very different, it was really exciting. It was a really growth opportunity. I think that I'm most proud of the work that we did at Isle because it really took this company that was once referred to as, and I'm not kidding you, pile of debris, to a company that was suited for acquisition for a company like El Dorado. And after that, I started my own company. <laughs> Uh, Jake Carcamone Associates, we do branding, strategy, and creative services um, for companies across the, um, across the nation. We work with regional operators, both large and small, and then we do some other work for some property, some companies that aren't casinos. Um, so we did that, and we also provide training for a lot of these um, companies, which is how we developed and started Casino Marketing Bootcamp. Um, and because the pandemic and the quarantine left me at odds with canceled jobs and a lot of wringing of the hands, I decided to write a book, which is available on Amazon. <laughs> but I'm really here to talk to you about, um, about casino marketing. And that brings me to Casino Marketing Monitor, which, um, Megan, if you can click. So Casino Marketing Monitor, we actually started this last year as a, a desire to take a look at the life of the casino marketer in the US. Kind of like the daily demands, what they were struggling with, what they were motivated by, uh, and to use this for, for purposes of growth and for purposes of developing more educational um, programs. But in April of this year, when the casinos started thinking through um, reopening and uh, we were having conversations with a lot of the operators, which weren't really sure they, you know, thanks to partnerships with companies like Aristocrat, they knew operationally what they needed to do, but marketing wise, they were still kind of guessing. And we know our customers really well, because as an industry, we do a lot of research, we do a lot of surveying. Um, but this really gave us a chance to take this engine that we already had with the casino marketing monitor and sort of focus it on casino customers. Um, so when we did the first survey with just the casino marketers, no surprise, growing revenue was the thing that was top of mind for everybody. And I'm sure it's top of mind for any company. Um, after that was developing their staff, which goes back to boot camp. You see how I bring it all together. <laughs> um, but then we took a look at the customers and just to let, to let you know, what we did was we queried the top 20% of customers at the regional operators. Um, when you saw Megan's slide with the revenue, you see that, and we'll, we're starting to see that the revenue hasn't really, I mean, it's, it's lower than year over year, but it's not as devastating compared to the capacity that we're working with. And a lot of that has to do because our core customer, which I will talk about in a moment, is still there. Um, the thing about COVID and research and and everything going crazy, if you could just click, is that um, we're all working with this together, right? So somebody said to me, it's like we're building a bridge while we're all walking on it. The good thing is that we're all walking on it together. And so we've got opportunities like AMA Las Vegas presenting this. Um, we've got opportunities to pick the brain of somebody like Brian Christopher, who you're gonna um, talk to next. Um, but this study uh, that we did in April, we started looking at the comments people had. Now, uh, a little bit more background in me is that I've done, I can't even count how many hours I've sat in dark rooms behind a two-way mirror, listening to customers and what motivates them and what they like. When we went through the survey, we took these comments from them and you can see that we created this kind of word cloud and the things that were coming up were things we had never seen from customers before. 
They were really focused on cleanliness and the staff and keeping people safe and um, still playing, but limiting capacity, social distancing, how they can still keep connected. Um, next slide. But as we said, one of the reasons that the, that the revenue has started to come back is because our core gamer is happy to be back in gambling. And they told us this in the monitor. So uh, just as, as some little snippets of that data, 85% of them, and I think, Megan, I think that 85 was the same number that you had in, in one of your slides. 85% of the people that we surveyed, now remember this is the top 20%, which usually accounts for 80% of most gaming revenue. 85% told us that they would visit the casino within a few weeks after reopening, and they did. And 41% of those people were planning to return immediately, like they couldn't wait. 68% um, of them said that they would probably gamble at the same frequency as they did prior to pandemic. And 71% told us that their daily casino budget would probably remain the same. So the core gamer, that small group that accounts for 80% of our revenue, they're still coming to visit. And in our conversation with some of the off-strip properties, and the regional operators, they've seen this to be true. Um, one, one thing that one of the offshore properties said to me is that the core customer seems to be much more compliant and they are um, invested in a mutual, she's termed it mutually assured success. So that's one of the reasons why you see some of the more local casinos, their uh, customers are adhering more to the safety standards than you see in some of the more transient markets. It, some people think that uh, the transient customers that are coming now to these gaming markets, they don't travel as much for gaming as the core customer. And so they're a little less willing to comply with the rules. Um, if you could click. But one of the newer elements that we um, discovered, and Megan, your research shows it too, is that the concept of safety is so important. But safety has almost become the theater that we're playing in now because customers wanted, told us that they wanted to see the hand sanitizer stations. 94% of them felt that the, the seeing those stations was essential, right? 90% of them wanted to see clean teams. They wanted to see them highly visible. They wanted to see limited see, seating. And they were more interested in feeling safe than they were in seeing us do promotions and giveaways. Um, you can click. So we have ongoing conversations with our operators and our advice is, is typically focused on three basic elements, right? So always understand your brand, the relationship you're building with customers and you have built with customers. Um, you'll know time and time again, trusted brands are going to always be questioned less, if at all. The other thing is that you really kind of have to shift your programs, right? Obviously moving from the kinds of programs that draw crowds and, and lines that are st still need to be engaging, um, hand-free, safe. Um, and then you also have to shift your messaging, right? So, you know, kind of how you're showing up for customers is as important as the offers that you're sending them. So that's kind of why, you know, you saw some of the operators cut their advertising or refocus their advertising. You saw a lot of big brands, um, you know, Think about how many emails you got telling you that the CEO or president of some company whose newsletter you subscribe to was thinking about you and going through this with you. The fact of the matter is that we're all going through this at the same time, but it's not all the same for us. So kind of understanding that from a customer perspective is very important. And lastly, the thing that we never should forget is that we're in the entertainment business. We can't forget that we still have to deliver the kinds of entertaining experiences people are gonna to wanna to leave their houses for. And one of the things that I've noticed with Brian's uh, post is that when he does a post, when he visits a casino, he's not just playing a slot machine and saying, here's a slot machine, it's cost a dollar pull. If you put in $3, you get this. It's really about the experience. He's telling people everything that's happening, the changes that are going on, and because he knows his customers, he's able to let them know what they're gonna be interested in. Are there smoking here? Is there non-smoking there? Is this restaurant open? So giving that whole experience 
and bringing that out there in all your communications, particularly your social, is going to be of utmost importance. Um, and finally, I think that one of our biggest recommendations is that you have to be really, really agile because your plans, your signage, your communications, they're going to change as authorities issue new guidance and new guidance is coming out continuously. I think that we all need to set up our own in-house printing press to keep up with all the changes that we have to put out there and communicate to customers. Um, so our three pillars, right? Brand, shift your thinking, entertain, and be agile. And this is uh, some contact information for me. I know that we're going to have Q&A at the end. Um, but if you uh, look for the hashtag casino marketing on social, we'll see a lot of our content. Thank you so much, Julia. We appreciate your time. That was great. Um, and now I'm going to pass it over to Brian and let himself give a little introduction. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, great to be here. And uh, yeah, I'll walk you guys through um, who I am and what I do. So I am a social media influencer for slot machines and casinos. That was probably no, not a thing a few years ago, <laughs> uh, but now it is. Um, so yeah, I'll talk about um, uh, marketing uh, slots online and how to attract uh, new, new guests right now, especially uh, now more than ever. Um, so yes, I do. I do play slots for a living. Uh, <laughs> it's one of those weird things. Uh, and people really have no idea. Like, like you do what? I'm sorry, what? Like, how's that work? You should see their faces. It's amazing. I love it. Um, no, I do not make a, a living playing slot machines because, uh, you know, everyone that plays a slot um, loses money in the long run. And uh, that's just the way it is. But uh, I, somehow I figured out a way to uh, market slot machines and casinos out there and, and, and somehow stay on top. So let me just give you a little uh, rundown of what I do and what my channel does over on YouTube. Uh, so currently, as of today, I have just over 289,000 subscribers. Uh, we get about 7 new thousand uh, subscribers every month, uh, 182 million views we have in total. Uh, that's another 5 million added every month. And the average watch time for one of our videos, which is crazy and unheard of, is on the dot right now, 20 minutes. Uh, normally on YouTube, you, you expect more like a minute, minute and a half. But our, our, our viewers are absolutely loving what we're putting out there. Uh, and our channel is ranked in the top 0.1% of all channels because it is just that popular. Uh, and then looking at what kind of audience we do have, uh, there's all of our age, age ranges. And we have seen this fluctuate a little bit more recently. Uh, we used to skew more younger, and now it's going a little bit more on the older side. Um, we do uh, have 57% male. Uh, and about half, half of the, it's about between 18 and 54 is half of our audience and above that is the other half. Uh, and something really interesting to, to know is that um, older viewers do watch longer, 33% um, longer in fact. So it goes up by every age bracket, it gets higher and higher and higher and higher and higher. So the older people will sit there and watch them forever. Uh, my dad is one of those people, he watches every single one of my videos and you will lose him for hours on end watching cat videos, so I get it. Um, um, all right, we'll move on. Uh, looking at where they're watching us from as well, 45% uh, are watching us over on their cell phone and another 11% on their tablet. So 54% is over on mobile devices. Uh, a big shift we've seen in the last couple of years is that people are watching us more on TV now as well, which is 29% and over on computer 13. That little sliver in there, uh, that's other consoles like gaming consoles. People can watch us on there too. Uh, I don't, but I, that's something people tend to do as well. Uh, so taking a look at our reach as well, um, an average video of ours gets about 100, just over 100,000 views. That's 4,400 likes and comments, a million impressions. Uh, and over uh, almost 800,000 unique viewers in a 90 day period. And I'm showing you a few of the, the videos we've done over the last couple of years, which I've got around a million to uh, three and a half million views. So people love to watch this stuff and they love to come to me to find out what's going on in the world of slots and casinos. So take a look at the, some of their responses. I won't read these all out, but all these are, are saying, you know, hey, I saw you playing on this platform. I saw you visit this casino, so now I gotta go there. Or I played that game you did last week, I hit a jackpot. 
it's this whole like monkey see monkey do kind of thing oh brian plays at that casino i gotta go there he's playing this machine now i know how to play that so then when i go to the casino i'll be i'll be good to do it uh same goes with uh you know all the safety procedures in place right now they um uh, Coeur d'Alene was the very first casino to reopen and so I jumped on a plane and I made sure I was there. I gave them a few days uh, after they opened till I came uh, and then I went live and I walked them through the entire process uh, of walking through those doors. Okay, now we're getting our temperature yeah. checks uh, one, one. and uh, now we're moving on. Okay, they have um, uh, masks are mandatory. There's barriers over here. Uh, you know, walk them through the whole process because they're looking to me for advice, not only in slots, but the whole experience. They want to know uh, what is it like to be in there. And it was my job to show them exactly uh, what that was like. And, and like Megan said, we did partner with Aristocrat on there uh, to spread awareness about everything. And we did do a lot of giveaways for them to help them out along the way. Um, so I, I feel very passionate, obviously, uh, about um, spreading news over social. I think it's extremely important, especially in these days. Um, a statistic out there is that every dollar spent um, on on media online uh, brings back another 685 back. Uh, that's how that's how strong it is right now. Uh, a recent there's a uh, a casino that we work with a lot, and they they always look to one website called uh, Clear, I believe it is, and this site will tell you exactly what our worth is. And so according to this website. Every video that we put out there is worth over $160,000 worth of marketing money that they, they, they could be putting elsewhere into, into like printed ads or something like that. Uh, I have never made that much yet on a video, but I'm hoping to one day. <laughs> but that just tells you how important it is and how many, uh, you know, where the marketing shift has happened uh, these days. If you want to attract us, uh, and by us, I mean younger generation, especially, you know, you want to get us into your casinos out there. You got to get social with us. Let us promote you, give us options, get fresh and keep us safe. And I'll, I'll go into details on each of those right now. So get social with us. Um, this is for millennials right now, but on average, millennials spend 19 hours uh, every single week on their smartphone. We don't realize that we're doing it, but we actually do. Uh, you know, if, you, if I had to guess, I'd probably say, oh, maybe 30 minutes a day I'm on my phone. But when you look at the stats, it's always a lot hard, higher. It's hours and hours on end. 83% um, of us prefer uh, texting as opposed to talking these days. 70% of us influenced by bloggers or vloggers. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. 40% uh, say that YouTubers understand them more than their friends. People will turn to me more than their friends, more than their family. They'll listen to us. Uh, on social media more than they will to a celebrity that's, that now endorses a product. So it's very important because they, they trust us. We are, we are lit I'm, not, I'm not there to, to like lie to them or tell them anything either way. I'm going to go to a casino. I'm going to win $1,000. I'm going to lose $2,000. They're going to see the, the, the highs and the lows of everything so that they come to trust us. Uh, another smart thing that casinos could do is let us promote you um, on Instagram. We want to uh, showcase our cocktails we're having and our meals that we're having, the times we're having with our friends. We want to tweet our shenanigans. We want to Facebook our gorgeous hotel room that we just got for free as a cop at a casino. And we want to video our big wins. Bottom line, we want to share our excitement. And when I go to a casino with some friends or even with a fa my family members, I was at a casino once, I asked the bartender to snap a photo of my, of my family and I as we're cheersing drinks. We were, so, we, were, we were told, sorry, you can't take photos in here. Are you kidding me? You don't want us to spread you know, our excitement and our joy with all of our friends and families? You don't want me to take a picture of my big jackpot I just wanted to share with everyone? It's very smart to do that. And some casinos have, have jumped earlier than others, one of those being the Cosmopolitan. Here's some quotes from Kevin Sweet, VP of uh, Slot Operations and Marketing. He says he realizes in today's world, technology and more sp specifically, uh, social media platforms are everywhere as a uh, form of constant connection and communication. So they, they did choose uh, really early to embrace this. And because of that, because of this, you know, I used to only play at Cosmopolitan in Las Vegas. 
So what do my my fans do? They only want to play there as well. You know, they they turn to me be like, Brian, it was like three times the price for that hotel room, but I paid it because you stay there, and you told us it's the only one with the the balcony on it. So we had to stay there, and oh my gosh, what a beautiful property! We ate at that restaurant. You did as well. So they got it. They jumped on early and that, earlier, and now many other casinos are are doing the same thing as well. We're looking for options out there. And that's in every single aspect. It's not millennials, but everybody. We all want options. We want options of a gaming selection, all different kinds of uh, entertainment, the different shows you can offer. Obviously, right now, it's a little bit uh, different these days. Uh, but we want um, different varying options for food, either quick serve or fine dining. You know, uh, millennials may not have as much money to spend. Um, so I want some, some better options in there too. And we'll touch on that in a second. Uh, and also uh, more comfort and luxury in our hotel rooms and options on there. I know there's some casinos that offer budget rooms with bunk beds for, you know, bachelor parties or something like that. So, so smart of them to get ahead of that. Um, and we're so much smarter these days and more educated, especially with, with COVID right now. We're looking for healthy living. We want quality food choices. We're looking for organic options. We're looking for healthy options. You know, if you have a juice bar in a casino or something like that, it's great. Some casinos I go to, uh, I mean, I used to, I used to be vegan. I had to give it up because I couldn't live a vegan lifestyle at casinos. There was just no options for me. I'd have to order in food to my hotel room in order to eat healthy. Uh, we also really understand the effects of secondhand smoke. And, and uh, like I did a big study with a lot of my fans recently where we found, uh, I mean, statistically 13% of the population of the US now smokes, 13%. Um, and in the casinos, you know, everyone thinks, oh, majority of, of gamblers all smoke, you know. We found through our study, it's just not true. Uh, an average of about 19% of our gamblers uh, that did the survey are smokers and that's it uh we're, we're we've woken up to it and especially in these times you know uh where you have to wear a mask and we're getting these emails uh like julie had mentioned earlier from uh you know casino leaders saying that they care about our safety and our health is, is of utmost importance well it needs to be and that includes smoking as well so you know sure you can mandate masks but if you're going to allow smoking still you're giving someone permission to take off that mask for about five minutes, walk throughout the property, smoke and blowing air everywhere. So we're on to that. Um, and now Park MGM uh, in Vegas is gonna be the very first casino to open non-smoking, the first one in, in a couple decades. Uh, and what did they do? They reached out to us and we're gonna be the first channel ever to go over there live this weekend, doing a live stream to promote them. Uh, and we're very, very happy to do that. The other thing is, you know, show us something new. We want to see what else is out there. You know, don't show us the old boring things. Show us something unique that makes you stand out. Um, and that, that's something that we always try and show in our videos is, you know, what stands your property out from other ones? Oh, look what they have in their hotel rooms. Look what they're doing with their players club. Um, or during COVID times, look how they're spacing out the machines. Look how they're making or keeping you safe as well. Um, you know, being at Coeur d'Alene, it was really important for those first few months. I mean, to date right now, in the last few months since casinos started reopening, we've visited um, uh, over 25 casinos now. And so <laughs> I don't know anyone else who's going to say they've actually done that yet. But I, I was able to do that. And I was able to showcase to everyone a difference on, at every single property about what they're doing. Oh shoot, I think my internet might have froze. I'm gonna just keep going and hopefully he's on this slide still. Update housekeeping procedures in there as well and rethinking dining options and how you do it. Did I lose you guys or are you still with me there? <laughs> I. I was, I lost you, so I don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think oh, I thought, froze it, was, I thought it was my machine. Slide. Did we get all this slide out there? Can you read it though? <laughs> yes. All right, cool. Basically, the bottom line was, you know, keep us safe, follow all these procedures. And I was just saying that, you know, some casinos do stand out from others. And I love that I've heard from a lot of casinos 
uh, that they are, you know, talking amongst one another about what, what's working for you, what's working for you, what's not working for you, what shall we improve on in that. Uh, like next week, I'm going to be moderating uh, the um, kickoff session over at G2E. Uh, and I'm going to be speaking with three different casinos to find out what exactly they did um, to stand out and, and how they communicated, communicated amongst each other to, um, to make it all work. So uh, that's what I have for you guys. And I look forward to answering some more of your questions. Thank you so much, Brian. I'm sorry that I lost you. I hope I hope everyone got that. Um, I am going to stop sharing so that we can open it up for questions now. Um, so guys, go ahead. Um, well, Jeremy, do you want to go through the chat, uh, the questions in the chat, or do you want me to do it? I just posted a question. If the attendees could just look at the chat, and if anyone who would uh, want to uh, chime in. We did have a question from Douglas Abbott, though, so I just reposted it. He uh, mentioned it during uh, one of the presentations. Yeah, so I, I can give you a little insight in that. So Doug was asking about um, whether we've seen some increases in website traffic, pages visited, and duration time, and I and I think generally the answer is yes, but I think that is. Um, a byproduct of people looking for information about the properties and the safety standards and what's going on. We've encouraged a lot of the properties to add FAQs in a really accessible spot so that they can constantly update them and keep people abreast of things. And I think that people are seeing that kind of um, increased activity. Thank you for your um, answer, that was good. I'm not Doug, but that was pretty good. <laughs> Um, Sorry, I'm reading. I'm reading through some of these questions. Um, Matt says he's curious to know more about the survey you conducted. Is that to Megan? I think that's to Megan, right? I think all three mentioned they conducted some surveys. Okay, Matt's a research guy, so I <laughs> like surveys. All... Yeah, there was. A, we did a variety of surveys. I mean, to be honest, obviously we had very open conversations with our customer. Which, to Julia's point, you know, we're getting a lot of feedback from casinos in regards to you know what they're looking to do what they can do what's feasible what's not feasible and how they're making information more accessible when it came to players um you know we have the luxury of you know being relatively influential as a gaming supplier on social media ourselves you know we're nothing comparative to brian i will go on record saying that he has an amazing following and i aspire to be him one day however um you know, we do have for a gaming supplier, you know, we have over 50,000 followers on Facebook. You know, I think that's kind of a daunting, like jarring number that people actually follow a supplier who makes slot machines because they're that much of a fan of the game. So those were some definite channels that we utilized in order to source feedback from our players. Um, and then honestly, it's it's relationships, right? Like we have a great relationship with Brian. We're super grateful for him that every time, you know, we have a new game, he's always willing to come out to events and play and share it with his followers. And it's really comes down to during a time when things are really hard, you have to come together to get mutually beneficial results. And so that survey was really our ability to not only source some of our player own, our own player feedback, but really tap into his audience and see if we could get some additional information that would help us in guiding our path. And yeah. I'll just, I'll add in there too, if I may. Uh, I just wanted to also thank um, Megan because, you know, as, as many, um, uh, there were a lot of people doing cutbacks and we lost a few deals that we were going to be doing with slot manufacturers and aristocrat did the opposite. You know, they came, came to us and said, how can we uh, make things better and safer and, and bring awareness out there to, to everyone in the casinos? What can we do? And that was like, wow, good for you guys. You know, yeah. so I want to just congratulate you on that. And I wanted to add that uh, with the monitor, we actually did use the databases for the regional operators. They supplied um, anonymized information to us. And then we, um, we did that via email. But the interesting thing is that um, the regional operators, I think, were lagging with email addresses up until this happened. And then now they realize the importance of it because it was the only channel they had for a while. Um, but We've done, I've done email surveys. Uh, we used to do media preference surveys to our database when I was at Isle. 
or even guest satisfaction surveys, it's amazing. Casino customers want to give you their opinions. So usually the return on the emails is pretty good. I just realized that we were recording, uh, so I should probably read read the question for those who can't see the chat in real time. But I'm going to post this one in the chat for uh, all three of you guys to give feedback on. But I'm just going to read it out loud. Have you noticed properties promoting their casino floor like new game launches and big wins more often than before the pandemic since other entertainment and dining, dining is closed? Oh, I can certainly um, speak to this one. I mean... You know, listen, I mean, I come from a background where I was supporting the tourism board for Las Vegas, right? And I'm here to tell you that based on the data that we had on an ongoing basis, gaming was always last. I mean, I don't want to say completely last, but it was not, it wasn't a revenue driving um, thing. And I, the best way that I would always compare that to people is it was so surprising that gaming wasn't number one is you know, people come to Las Vegas for the first time and, you know, oh, it's your 21st birthday and you play a machine for 20 minutes and then you go to a nice dinner and you go to a show and you do all these other things, right? Um, I think that this situation provided a unique opportunity for us where casinos didn't necessarily have all of those other what I would call distractors for myself as a marketer for slot machines of things for people to do. Certain restaurants were closed shows are obviously still severely affected by all of this. And so it really has been a time that casinos have continued to reinvest in their floor, coming down to game configuration, trying to get creative with events. You know, it has been challenging, but um, you know, we were in a competitive position where we had quite a few games lined up to release right before all this happened, those paused. And then we basically came out with, you know, five new games since June. Um, and we're able to partner with casinos in order to launch those and drive some excitement at the property. So I think that's definitely um, created some new value in gaming and hopefully it will be something that continues to stay. I mean, again, to my earlier point, it's about having fun, right? So hopefully people continue to play. And, you know, I work primarily in the regional markets. So the regional markets are sort of the flip of Las Vegas. Gaming is their core business at these properties. And so the you know, food and beverage in the hotel are, are still considered amenities. And so they, they've they not stopped um, promoting the games and winners. That's what these regional customers want. Cool. Um, this one is for Brian, for our buddy, Jason Soto. I'm gonna post it in the group right now. Um, it's part, question for Brian, is part of your social influence revenue coming from gaming manufacturer sponsorships, i.e. promote specific games or casino sponsorships, i.e. promote properties? Are you doing all of this in person or are you playing slot, slot mobile apps also, also Twitch, question mark? Yeah, oh, I mean, <laughs> uh, yeah, our, um, our, my revenue from social influence can, can come from every, every direction. It can come from uh, casinos or it could come from manufacturers. Uh, oftentimes we do joint deals with everyone. So we're promoting everyone at the same time as well. Um, and uh, as far as far as mobile, yeah, we do promote mobile apps also during our, our videos. Um, I don't do Twitch or anything else. I stick strictly to uh, Facebook and YouTube for our videos. Cool. Thank you. Uh, this one's from, do we already get to Matt's Seltzer's question? This one's about emailing. I'll post it in the group. No, they 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 got it. I appreciate you it. You got the conducting surveys about the going outside of your audience as well. Oh, maybe not. I didn't. Uh, see that one. So the last part, yeah. which I, I'm actually really curious as well, because uh, I used to do marketing for a hotel. But I'm curious: Are you emailing your current audience or going outside of that group as well? I guess to attract. And Matt, you can maybe clarify. No, that was that was exactly what I was looking for. I I thought that okay. might be too in the weeds for the research folks. <laughs> I, dig, I I'm excited. Yeah. <laughs> Matt, we're gonna have to get you involved with the monitor. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, let's do it. Um, let's see. So I saw one. I saw a question from Doug about the uh, what I think he called it the pound and play slot, slot tournaments, and um, interestingly, I was talking to Foxwoods. Uh, just this week and they did their first slot tournament and they actually did the every other machine uh, was used in the tournament and they reserved times. So there was there was 
many more flights in the slot tournament, but they were doing kind of the same way. They just sort of spread it out a little bit more. Yeah, I actually, I actually just hosted one in, uh, in Vegas a few weeks ago, and it was the same idea. They did uh, one on, two off, one on. Uh, it was not quite the same ex level of, of, of excitement because instead of there being 10 people spinning at once, there's like three. Um, and instead of it being, you know, like a two hour period, it was a six hour period, you know? So it's not the same level of, of excitement, but it, it was still exciting for the people involved to still be a part of that and, and win. Here's a good question. Um, is COVID affecting the balance between slot slash machine play and live games, cards, dice, roulette? I suppose in the chat. I don't know, Megan, can you answer that? I think that I've, I've started to see a lot of more promotion of the e-tables, the electronic table games. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, listen, I think there is an element of choice that still exists, right? Like I think from a player perspective with people coming back, if you're a slot player, you're going to gravitate towards what you used to. If you're a table player, you're going to gravitate towards that. You know, what I can say is I think we've seen some increase in, in you know, table and, and live play since um, some resorts made decisions to put up dividers because um, that wasn't something that they had originally done to begin with. So tables were a little more complicated, but I think that really just comes down to personal choice. I wouldn't say that it's really one way or the other, to be honest. Good feedback. Um, here's another one from Ruth. I just posted in the group. In the PR world early on in the pandemic, there was a big concern about being quote tone deaf in marketing. Curious with any of the panelists, any mistake or error in judgment you saw that you are seeing or still seeing that all we need to avoid at all costs. Who's messing up? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know that I've seen a lot of the casino operators mess up because the fact of the matter is that they immediately pulled their advertising before they, I mean, as soon as they, they realize that now, you know, my branding head says out of mind, out of, your wallet, you know, and so people aren't going to remember you that much. You got to stay um, current. So it was really important that they really think about the message. But I haven't seen, I, I think that I saw one operator doing one of the big promotions. And I remember thinking, what are you doing? <laughs> but uh, tone deaf, maybe not tone deaf, maybe just plain dumb. <laughs> and there you have it. <laughs> I appreciate the bluntness. And also, I was well aware when the casinos pulled their advertising. So <laughs> as a billboard man, as a billboard man. Um, here we go. Here's a good one from Matthew King. Have casinos given you any indication as to when they might go back to in-person promotions? I have seen, um, I think that they are, they're trying to take whatever um, programs they can uh, to reduce the lines and reduce big crowds. I think they want to do the promotions. They're just trying to figure out how to do it without drawing, you know, without putting 200 people around a drawing drum waiting to see who's going to win the car. Um, you know, I know that, uh, sorry, Megan, Cy Games has that player boutique and a lot of their, uh, a lot of the people, a lot of companies have changed their uh, continuity programs to something like that because they do that drop from Amazon. So it's a little more touchless. Um, I think it's going to be a while before they start doing those big promotions. I mean, I've, I've been to many casinos, like I said already, um, and a lot of them have actually brought it back also. Um, what many of them have done is usually it would be every Wednesday you come in, you get your free pot or pan or whatever it is that week. Now they've <laughs> extended it to uh, come in Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday. You know, they've spread it out over longer periods of time, longer daytime. So there is no huge lineup or, or anything like that, or change things over to weekends. Uh, anything that they can to, to try and change that up. Yeah, and I would agree with that. I mean, like I said, we have some casinos that we work with who have, you know, have wanted to do player promotions and it's just not feasible. We've done some who have done free play events where, like I said, you know, they segment a certain number of their play, player database to limit the number of people. Then they schedule them to come in. 
Um, you know, and then I've seen everything from, you know, MGM Resorts just did their most recent slot tournament a couple of weeks ago, and they actually did, you know, their big drawings virtually, where it was, you know, a call in and you watched the names be randomly selected on one of those random name generators, which again, you know, to someone's earlier point about not being as exciting as a normal slot tournament, I don't percent agree, but it was a really good solution given the situation that they're in. Um, I think we have time for two more, if that's okay with you guys. Um, here's one. Just post in the chat. How are the different casino market consumers reacting as they try to reignite the gaming industry? Are Asian gamblers in China different than South America versus USA versus Australia? I guess COVID-wise, how are they? How are we trying to do this? I'm assuming each market is slightly different, but. Yeah, I think the biggest thing from our perspective, you know, like I said, we're in 300 different licensed jurisdictions and our Asia Pacific region obviously was impacted by this first and we had a little bit more time to prepare as we kind of saw what they went through at a property level and how that was going to adapt from a US standpoint. Um, you know, I would say from, you know, a China and Asia Pacific perspective, I wouldn't say they've 100% gotten back to normal, but they are very much seeing, you know, an, an increase in player demand since reopening. Um, you know, Australia obviously has had its up its and downs, but they've seen pretty steady as well. So I think it's really just relative to where they are in the situation. I think just from a global perspective, each market's in a very different position from a timing perspective of where they are in regards to recovery from this. So I wouldn't necessarily say there's a player differentiation. I think the demand is just based on kind of where the climate of the market sits as today. So. Thank you for your feedback. Here we go uh, from Douglas Abbott. How have the player loyalty tier evaluations changed post COVID-19? I have to first apologize. My dog is barking. So hopefully I can get this out before you. It's okay, you're good. The world um, of most, most of the operators have extended, you know, just like Brian mentioned how people are taking their promotions and extending the window. Most of them have tried to extend it just like the airline. So they've tried to protect the tiers for a bit. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. You can pick him up and show him off if maybe he wants to see what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. Cool. Well, I think, I think that's it. Unless you, well, you know, we could do this one. This is very, I guess it's very hyper focused Las Vegas, but, um, to Bill Townsend's question is, how are you responding to the increased violence in Las Vegas? It seems like we're having more violence on the Strip in Fremont, and I'm not sure, is that affecting casinos at all? Is that affecting play, or are people just excited to get back to the casino, maybe? I think one of the, I think one of the issues is that, um, you know, I always say the composition of the visitor market in Las Vegas changes throughout the year, right? So in the fall, you have higher rates. In the summers, you have people that are more value-based. And unfortunately, I think that value base got pushed a little further into the fall. And a lot of people that normally wouldn't travel took advantage of great rates at some great properties, right? And um, as somebody at the on Fremont said, the transient market, they didn't travel that as much as the core customer they're not as compliant. I think eventually it's going to work itself out though. It'll, th that rate will start to rise and it will start to edit. My thoughts exactly. <laughs> I mean, I'm in New Orleans, right? New Orleans draws a lot of great people and it draws a lot of people that end up in jail. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, we are so grateful to all of you for being on this call. We thank you so much for preparing your slides and just presenting all of the fantastic information that you shared. Um, and that is it. So you guys, we will send out um, a recording to everyone who was on the call. If you signed up, um, you will get that. It'll also be on our YouTube channel. And um, we will also, again, share in our newsletter the information from this um, webinar, but also what's coming up for November. So do make sure that you follow us, like us, 
um, and sign up for our email at amalasvegas.com. And again, thank you all. Bye.